in your home. Uh, they really, really work. It's focused, so I'm going to make it better. I think. Is I'm making it better or worse? Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, I got to tell myself that because nobody else does. Uh, anyway, the, 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 uh, but yeah, we get into what we start to call the modern era in, in this. Um, and the first thing it starts out with in the modern era is neoclassicism. Okay, I would, neoclassicism, you're not going to read about it after this. But that doesn't mean that Cicero and Aristotle die. Actually, they're way dead. But that doesn't mean their works die off. In fact, I would say that a lot of the work I do is very much, it would probably still be neoclassic. Um, a lot of the work I do, classicism doesn't die off. Plato and Aristotle don't die off. But you can see that there's, there's this, this thing. You, the world is about to change. Right? The world is about to change. And what are some of the things that are changing the world? Just from, from, from your view that you have of history, what are some of the things happening that change the world in this time? Isn't it like the age of enlightenment? Yeah. Where does that come from? Mm, coming out of the dark ages? Yeah, but why? They are coming out of the dark mm. ages. Absolutely. Thought. The world is changing. What? Thought. Well, people have been thinking, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it is thought. It's like a... How do you get enlightened? Not in a Buddhist sense. That's a, that's a different thing. How does the world get enlightened? Education. Education. Yeah, yeah through education. What's... But why does education, do you think, change here? Um. It, it does. It radically changes. At this point, uh, this is when universities as we know them start to come into being. Right. Uh, it moves from private to public. Uh -huh. well, not really. Not really. The move from public to private is more, more recent, actually. Um, Does it move away from being like secular? It moves into being, into being more secular. secular. Uh, and it moves into being more secular. So there, there's a lot of things that are happening now. Um, a lot of things that really, really change things. Uh, the development of the compass. Uh, now, you know, we're looking at you know several hundred years earlier than, than the neoclassicists was Columbus's voyage, but you know, the, the rest of the world is the world is finding each other, right? Europeans develop compasses and the world starts to find each other. Now, sometimes we call this the age of exploration or something like that, but that's from a very European standpoint. Right. <laughs> it's it's not like the Indians were like, hooray, we got discovered. Um, or something like that. Uh, we hadn't existed <laughs> until now. But the world starts to find each other, and a huge, huge part of that is the compass. Another thing that has to do with education um, that really brings about the enlightenment that we have, the printing press, right? And paper. Uh, both of those come within a few years of the printing press and paper uh, kind of come together in this time. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what we talked about to the extent that we talked about anything was, was prepping. The printing press and paper come together at this time. And the printing press is, is a really big deal. Paper's a really big deal, too, right? Uh, this is a, we talk about new media a lot, right? And new media like, you know, Twitter and Facebook and video and stuff like that. But I don't think any of them are as revolutionary paper. as paper, right? Paper was a new medium. And it was crazy because it was cheap now to write. And that changes education. Can you imagine having gone through college? 
most of you are through a chunk of it at this point. Can you imagine having gone through college without paper? I mean, I guess I would have to put all my notes on my phone then. No, I mean, like, nothing that you could take home that you'd written in class. You couldn't take notes. If you did take notes, it was a big deal, and you might have one student taking notes on, on parchment, because not everybody was going to be doing that. That would be crazy. You'd have to have like a photographic memory or something. You, you'd have to have a really good memory. You'd have to have a really good memory to remember what had been discussed in classes. And there were classes. Uh, the classes were primarily in, in in monasteries, so I guess people were undistracted by sex, uh, but which is pretty distracting. But yeah, this this idea of of paper and, and writing, and so when we get into the belle lettre, uh, the belle lettre, if you if you look at it, this, you, you see that it's chapter six, the belle lettre. Thou means beauty, beautiful. It's, this is French. Belle lettre is a French word. And that's really where the belle lettre got going, is in continental Europe. Um, although, although a lot of the people you'll be reading, you read here, uh, were in Britain. Uh, but the belle lettre got going in continental Europe. And, uh, the letra means letter. So, belle letra means beautiful letters. Okay, so that's, that's what we're looking at here is the beautiful letters. And so, as, as we go through the belle letra movement, you see people really focused on what in the, the classicists would call style and delivery. But really style. Really style. This is where they get really into the study of words and how words work to create beauty, which was not an issue if the chances of you actually ever writing a word are fairly slim. We live in a world now where it's, where it's not. Now, the neoclassicists, they, they react to this. And, you know, they're kind of like, I don't know, if you, have you ever seen the photo, photo lab here at WNMU? Mm -hmm. Photo lab, is it? You have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have. What's uh, interesting about it? Well, it's dark. It's dark. <laughs> it's, yeah. Full of chemicals. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, it's a, it, here's the thing, it wasn't that long, it was before I came, but it wasn't that long ago when WNMU got some money to put in a new photo lab. And the professors who were running photography at the time said, this digital thing is never going to catch on. <laughs> uh, this is a fad which is much the way Jonathan and Swift saw the belle lettre. It's a fad. It's a fad. We're going to, this new technology of paper, nobody's going to like that long term. You know, even though technically, I mean, he had to have a printing press to do what he did. But, you know, the, this idea that all of these bad books are being written, right? Because anybody can write. So all of these bad books are being written and printed. And we want to go back and focus on the good books. Right? That's that's the belle lettre. And it kind of that's that was the idea in the photo lab here. We had this new technology of digital coming in, and people say, Yeah, there's digital, but all it's resulting in is some bad pictures. We want to go back to film where you get the good pictures. And it's kind of a similar thing that the neoclassicists are doing. There is a lot that and there is, there's a lot of bad books being written. And right now, you know, if you want to publish a book. Go on Amazon and you can publish one today. 
Well, you have to write it first. Uh, and then you publish it, right? And anybody can download it to their Kindle. And uh, read your book. And nobody checks your spelling. Right? Nobody checks your grammar. Nobody makes sure there's anything good about it. Because uh, there's a lot of bad books. So there are a lot of bad books being published that you can get for 99 cents on your Kindle. Well, that's kind of a similar thing to what was happening with the neoclassicists. They were looking at it and they were saying, there are a lot of books being published. And most of them aren't any good. And that's true. Right? Of, of just of paperbacks that you can go buy down at the store. How many of you that those are good books? Like, this is going to stand the test of time. This is going to improve my soul. Not very many. Not very many. I saw a meme and, uh, the other day, going back to photography, and it showed the evolution of cameras. And it, it showed the you can take the original this this old film. You can take six pictures. You can take twelve pictures. Six would be good. The next the rule of twenty four. You can take twenty four pictures. Six would be good. And now. With digital, you can take 6,782 pictures. Six will be good. <laughs> right? And that's, that's kind of the same thing, same thing here. Um, every time technology expands, it does produce. Every time, to, every time communication democratizes, it does produce more bad work. Absolutely. More bad work. There are more things being published, so more of it is poor, poor work. Um, and that's true. And that, and so the the neoclassicists, they weren't crazy. They weren't crazy. Uh, they didn't want to see all this bad work published. They didn't want to waste time. Do you ever feel like you're wasting time reading bad books? Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody maybe assigns you a book, or you feel like you have to read Harry, Harry Potter to be culturally literate, and you're like, this is not great writing. Um, and it's not, it's aimed at, for, you know, the first one is aimed at third graders, right? So it's not great writing. Uh, but anyway, well, it's not meant to be. Uh, so you're like, I have to read this because everybody's talking about it, and it's not good. Um, and so this, this, this kind of, you don't want to waste time reading bad books. Um, and that's kind of kind of the neoclassicist's uh, big argument, is we don't want to waste time reading bad books. And this idea that this new technology, printing press and paper, even though they were dependent on it, they didn't like what it was doing to society. Uh, and society really did change. The Belletra thought that they had a, a solution to this problem. And that was they would write good books. They would write good letters. They would write beautiful letters. They would write beautiful. And some of it was actually letter writing, like correspondence, like in, like, uh, like an epistle, like, like I would write you a letter, like I would send you an email, right? The Belletra look at it and they they can write beautifully. But what good does it do to write beautifully if you don't understand beauty? And that's really what they get into. Uh, in order to produce beautiful communication. And you know you you've seen it. You ever watched an advertisement where you're like, that's pretty. I just think Pizza Hut. I don't really like Pizza Hut. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not my favorite pizza. Have you ever see that where they're slicing that mushroom? Yeah. It's just so sensual. I mean, it's just as they're slicing the mushroom. It's so powerful. You're like, pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, they're really trying to capture that. And it goes back to this platonic ideal. Remember Plato, the perfect in the minds of the gods. When you create an advertisement, right, 
for a cheeseburger. It's got to be beautiful, right? Doesn't do any good for Paris Hilton to bite into it if it's an ugly cheeseburger. It's got to be beautiful. So they got this idea of in order to make things beautiful, we've got to figure out what beauty is. Right. And so they focused on a few things. One of the things that they went back to, so you remember Longitis? Remember him? Mm. Remember what he talked about? The sublime. The sublime. To give people an experience of the sublime. That was something. And, and the difference between just beauty and sublimity. Um, and to try and give people that sublime experience or a beautiful experience. They got really into the study. And in fact, the truth is Longinus probably didn't matter a huge amount when he was written. And he probably didn't matter a huge amount all through the Middle Ages. People copied his work apparently because there it was when we get to here. But this is when Longinus, even though he'd been dead for a thousand years, I don't know how long he'd been dead. Um, they've been dead for a long time. This is when he starts to matter. Because suddenly, we want to figure out how to make something beautiful. And, and you feel, see a lot of things come out of the Belle Lettre movement that the textbook doesn't get into, like romanticism. Right? The romanticism is this philosophy uh, that comes out of Belle Lettre, And it's the idea of the natural the, the beautiful, uh, the picturesque is something that they'll talk about. If you read poems by Lord Byron or Percy Shelley, which are my favorite poems in, in the world, uh, they were coming out of this era of, of recapturing beauty and trying to understand beauty. And so there are a lot of bad things, I think, bad things that come out of Romanticism, the idea of the noble savage. Uh, that somehow we would be better off if we all lived in tribes. Uh, and that, that's, and you'll see it today every now and then. You'll see the Native Americans lived closer to the earth. They used all parts of the buffalo. We are wasteful. We use all parts of the cow. We do. Those bones get ground up. They, the, the hide becomes leather. The meat becomes food. We even use the manure to grow, to grow other food. Uh, it's not that they lived closer to the earth than we do. We just do it faster and better. Uh, but but this idea of, of the no of, of noble and natural and, and beautiful. And so they got really interested in the sublime. They got really interested in beauty. And they got really interested in taste. And that's why I was interested when I uh, read Eric's article on the cheeseburger. So... Go ahead. Before you ate, he wrote this article. You should all go read it uh, if you haven't. It's wonderful. It's funny. It's an editorial. It's it's great. It's mm, that's that's why he that's why he published it. And you should all be getting published. Uh, but anyway, uh, but that's why I put it out there, and it's gotten it's gotten a lot of traction. But it's it's an article. I should let you introduce. He, he goes and eats a cheeseburger at Sparky's. That's all it is. Do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead. He goes and eats a cheeseburger. Um, we were com I was coming back from the state meetings in Santa Fe, and we stopped in Hatch at Sparky's Burgers, which is supposed to be one of the top ten green chili cheeseburgers in the state. And uh, we sat down at the restaurant, myself and some members of student government, and I got served first. I took a bite out of the picture. Or a, a, <laughs> hold on. Okay. Organizing my thoughts. I took a bite out of the burger. Um, Harry Wetton, who's one of the student government members, was like, he was the one really pushing for me to review it in the paper. And he was who like, is well, also British, he's which also matters British. because he grew he's, up in this philosophy that we're reading. So he's like, in how's it taste? How's the texture? How's the composition? The warmth? And, the, and <laughs> right. I'm just like, it's kind of like biting into a pillow. And everyone just started laughing because that was the most ridiculous statement that the most ridiculous subscription or dis description. I have so many things on my mind right now. I'm sorry. And then they took bites of the burgers and they were like, it is kind of like biting into a pillow. And they were asking like what I thought of the green chili. And I'm like, well, it tastes like it's from Hatch. 
it's kind of hatchy, <laughs> which is kind of because it, it is from hatch. But I mean, if you've ever had hatch green chili and then another type of green chili, you could kind of tell like yeah. the difference. You know, there's something unique about Hatch's green chili. So it was kind of the worst food review ever, but I think that's why people liked it because it was just so terrible but fun to read and it, it was fun to read yeah well, I, I, I but one other thing harry suggested what is it like what is the texture what is the what is the softness and you say in your article that before you even made you decided how you were going to know what a good cheeseburger tasted right you decided you were going to go into that and so this is what you, Blair, and the rest of, is the Bellatristic Movement and the Rhetoric of Hugh Blair. Hugh Blair is probably the Belletra author that we read the most in English. Um, we read the most from Hugh Blair. Um, he's probably not the most prolific Belletra author, but at this time the dominant language in the world was not English. The dominant language was French, and we just like to read English, um, and so we do. And a lot of those belles lettres French authors, uh, we don't even have them in translation, so unless you read French, it's too bad for you. Uh, so, but yeah, Hugh Blair, he, he got into this idea of taste, and it's a complicated concept, but a good person, if we're going to start producing, if we're going to respond to the neoclassicists, recognize that this new technology is creating a problem. Okay? And this, new, this problem is that bad books are being written, among other things. Bad books are being written. Letters are being poorly written. We are mass producing for the first time in history. And when we mass produce, we are mass producing bad stuff. Right? And so... The 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 the, the Belletra people think we have the way we can solve this is by having people develop taste, um, and you see that in in Eric's review. Before we ate the burger, we decided the burger would be judged by texture, softness, texture, softness. taste, texture, composition, and warmth. Yeah, it takes texture, composition, and warmth. That's what we're going to judge it by. Because a good cheeseburger would be, would have a certain taste. You would have, you'd be able to taste the meat and the cheese. The chili wouldn't be able to, I mean, you don't say all that, but you kind of taste texture. You know, if it's, if you end up chewing on your cheeseburger, you know it's not a good one. Right? Um, it's not, that's not a good cheeseburger on warm. You don't want it to be so hot you can't eat it, but a cheeseburger should be hot. Right? So you got to judge it based on these. And that is a good cheeseburger. And that's what the Belletra were, they would have loved it. I mean, they would have said other things about the article. It was terrible. Uh, but uh, Hugh Blair would have, would have had some things to say about, about some of your choice in verbiage. Uh, and I'm not sure he'd be right. But anyway, but he definitely would have. He would have said, you know, this is not sublime writing. Uh, but anyway. Uh, but the idea there of we define beauty and then we have the experience with the beautiful. We define the sublime and then we have the experience with the eternal. This is how you can know if something is good. Uh, and it's and it's very platonic, right? Uh, very platonic that there is this, there is. God knows there is a good cheeseburger, a good chili cheeseburger, and God in heaven knows what it is. And if we just taste a cheeseburger and it's good, we don't know whether we've come close to what God knows is a good cheeseburger. But if we define first. We define first and then have the experience. And there's a large extent to which uh, that's what I'm having you do in your rhetorical criticism papers. This is where criticism comes from, the way we understand criticism now. 
right? Although I'm asking you to do the artifact paper first, so you have the experience first. Um, you have the experience first, but the theory already exists. The theory that you're going to go into, you've, you've chosen a theorist, some of you by now have chosen a theorist that you want to look at. That theory already exists. And so when you, when I did this assignment, because I totally plagiarized this assignment, uh, I did this very assignment from my, my uh, when I took this class with this book, uh, I did the same assignment. And I was really into a book at that time called The Celestine Prophecies. Have any of you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. It's a crazy new age book about how our auras are changing because we're evolving. And I thought, this is great stuff. Uh, I love this stuff. And then I used another person who we get to today, I think. Uh, wait, wait, what is it? Uh, Campbell, yeah. I used Campbell's theory of moral reasoning to look at it and realized it was total bunk. Um, it didn't stand up to moral reasoning. Uh, but what you're, what you're doing there, you take the theory. The theory already exists. And so you apply the experience to the theory, right? And that's what I'm asking you to do this. And this is what, what it comes from. It comes from in the Belle Etre, applying the experience to the theory. And that's really what we're trying to do. It's kind of exciting, I think. Uh, because the theory already exists. How do you know? What are some of the theorists that you've already chosen? Have any of you chosen yet? Mm -hmm. yeah, some people have. You chose Mary Astle. Mary Astle, right? And yeah, oh, she, she, the page one forty. Yeah, uh, you you chose one forty. And so that would have been in this reading. Okay. Early feminist writer. Yeah. Yeah, early feminist writer, and she was the one who looked at the who. Had, Serious proposal to the ladies. A serious proposal to the ladies that they should give up. Uh, she's proposing Protestant nunnery. Yeah. Uh, that you should you should give up basically family life in order to focus on intellectual life. Right? Um, um, that the that the two are separate, and that it's a good idea to focus to the extent that you can on the, on the intellectual life. That's her theory. So you can take any artifact then. That's why I allow you to choose any artifact, right? Mm -hmm. You can take any artifact and say, does this live up to Mary Astle's or spells? Uh, does it live up to that? Does it, does it give up? The family to focus on the election intellectual does this any anything we make fun of sometimes people who do this or i see people making fun of it on facebook people who say you know a feminist reading of budweiser beer and you're like really it's beer it's not feminist it's not but it is everything is because you can apply her theories to the beer and say, does this improve women intellectually? Does this beer, you know, and what does the act of drinking, I mean, it is a different act, right? It's a different act for a woman to drink a beer than a man to drink a beer. It's a political act, or it's not for a man. And especially to drink a Budweiser beer, right? But you're, the way you're asserting yourself in that moment. So you can do this, so you can say, that's why I let you study anything for your artifact, anything you want. So, you know, hopefully you've started doing research on whatever your artifact is, and I don't care. I don't care. Because then you apply the theory, and the theory already exists. So you apply the theory to the artifact. And that's, that's what was really going on uh, with your cheeseburger. That's why I thought it was so good for explaining you, Blair, and our beginnings of criticism, is because you apply the theory to the artifact. But first you develop the theory. You have to know what a good cheeseburger is, because if you just bite a cheeseburger, fat and salt taste good to human taste buds. That's why we eat cheeseburgers. And even a bad one 
you know, it's kind of like pizza and sex. Even a bad one is still pizza, and even bad sex is still sex. You know, I mean, this is good. Uh, so <laughs> there it is. Even it's still better than. Uh, but if you set up what is good sex, you can do sex as your heart attack. Um, you set up what is good sex. And then uh, before you have sex, then you can judge sex according to the theory you developed, right? And so it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing. And, and this is how you can know if something is good. And you might say, well, that's still, if you develop the theory, it's still only what's good to you. Not necessarily, because if you start out with what's good, and then you apply the, the theory to it, then... You have the criteria beforehand, and you usually don't develop those criteria in a vacuum. These are things that have told you historically what's good. So when you watch the Pizza Hut commercial, you watch them slicing that mushroom, you can say, that's beautiful. But the people who created the advertisement, they had to have a theory of what would be beautiful before they went in. And now you see it, and you don't even have that criteria, but you're like, and so, you know, they've got the tomato in the background and something green, probably a bell pepper back there. You can't really tell it's out of focus. The red and the green and the white mushroom. And slowly, if you ever worked fast food and you slowly cut something like that, you will be fired. Uh, but they slowly cut that mushroom. Uh, although you don't even, the mushrooms come pre-cut. Uh, so, yeah, they, well, they were cut by a machine. Not some beautiful hand. It was probably a hand <laughs> model doing it. You know, a hand that's perfect. It doesn't have any warts on it. It doesn't have dirty fingernails. It's a perfect hand. It's holding that shiny knife and cutting that mushroom. And you're like, this is a beautiful experience. Pizza would then be a beautiful experience. And you can sell things. So any of our communication, I mean, it gets it down to that. So that was... Really, I think it makes sense. When I first looked at it, I thought, why are they putting, why are they putting the neoclassicists with the bel -etre? That didn't make sense to me. Well, why are they uh, they, they're putting the neoclassicists with the bel -etre? It's because they were both trying to solve the same problem. There are bad, there is bad communication going on. There are bad Facebook posts. Now that we're all pub, there are bad books being written. There are bad, anytime there's a new communication technology that democratizes communication, it means there's going to be more bad communication. So how can we find the good communication? And that's really, the neoclassicists were saying, we can't. Let's go back to the old stuff. It was better. Let's go listen to vinyl. You know, this is, uh, we're just going to go back to it. We can't. We can't. The, the letter are saying, I think we can find a way. We can find a way. The epistemologists also come out of, will come out of this new technology of the printing press. And they're looking We say the word epistemology. Um, the word epistle means letter. So the bel lettre and the epistemologist in some way, they were both looking at letters. But the word epistle means letter, like to write a letter to somebody. But epistemology, and when you write a letter to somebody, especially in a situation where we don't have TV, we don't have radio, you write a letter to somebody, and then they know what's happening because you're writing them a letter, right? So, I mean, when I was a kid, we would get we lived in Alaska. My grandparents moved, lived in in Nebraska, and we would get a letter, and then we would know that my aunt Shelley had gotten something for her birthday. Right? And then before that, we didn't know, but now we knew because we had gotten a letter. And so when we talk about epistemology, we're talking about how is it that you know something. That's what epistemology was really about. And it really mattered. It really mattered because up until this time, up until, up until recently, 
how did you know anything? You, even if you got a letter, you couldn't read it if you were a normal person. If you got a letter, right, in, in, uh, in 1200, somebody, a distant family member, sends you a letter. They probably didn't write it. They went to their priest, had the priest write it for them. Saved up a ton of money to buy the parchment name. Had the priest write it for them. And then when you got the letter, you wouldn't have the priest read it to you. Because he could read. He was the only person who could. And that was okay because it wasn't a good skill for you to have. It's really a waste of time to learn to read in a world before the printing press. It's a terrible thing to... Well, it takes a long time. You know, we're working with my daughter right now, who's three. And she can recognize eight or nine letters, right? And she's a little J, she always recognizes because she's Jubilee. So she recognizes J right away. Uh, she recognizes, she gets M and W confused because they look, they both look like mountains. And we have a W on our mountain, which I think makes it worse. Um, they both look like mountains and then a W on the end. So anyway, they, uh, she, she can recognize a few letters. And we're spending a lot of time really on this, trying to get your letters. And that is, would really be a waste of time if she wasn't growing up in a world where there were going to be books. Right? It would be a horrible, horrible thing to be doing to her, probably even abusive, uh, to, to teach a kid letters in a world where there wasn't going to be books. Uh, but it's not, because she's going to grow up in a world where she is going to have to read. The epistemologists are coming into this world for the first time where everybody is able to read. And in this world where everybody's able to read, more people are able to, of course, not everybody. Even still, we don't have universal literacy. Uh, but more people, are, more people are able to read. And in this world where more people are able to read, then you have to understand what you're reading. Right before you did, because when somebody, when the priest was reading mostly the Bible to you, then he was the only one who had to worry about understanding, and he would explain it to you. And there's a lot of stuff that comes out of this. Uh, these epistemologists, the vast majority of them are uh, Protestant, uh, and the vast majority of them are clergy. The Catholics for quite a while. I mean, Deco, Deco and Descartes, of course, Catholic. Um, but the vast majority of Protestants, the vast majority of cl are clergy. Because they're coming at this for the first time where they are clergy members in a world where their parishioners have a Bible and can read it for themselves and come to their own conclusions. So how is it that we come to conclusions? This becomes a real the real issue. How do we know what is true? And that's sometimes if we say epistemology we, now, we say this is what's true. How do we know what's true? It's a big question. It's a big question. In fact, if nothing gets posted on the discussion board by the end of the day, that's our question. Look at the epistemologists, uh, including Campbell and Whateley, who are both both epistemologists. Look at the epistemologists and their struggles with how do you know what's true, especially look at the argument between Campbell and Hume about the veracity of the Bible. How do you know what's true? Because, um, of course, Campbell and Waitley both disagree with, they're both Protestant ministers, they both disagree with Hume, who's an atheist. Uh, about the veracity of the Bible. And they both are able to do this. Um, I always think of Campbell. I've read more Campbell than I have Waitley. I don't know if I've ever read Waitley except what's quoted from him. Uh, so, uh, but I've read, I've read Campbell's work. George Campbell and, and Waitley both argue with David Hume. David Hume disagrees. He doesn't disagree with the, the veracity of the Bible entirely. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous for anybody in any age. Of course, the Bible says there's a place called Jerusalem. Guess what there is? 
Uh, he doesn't, doesn't argue with that. What he's worried about is miracles in the Bible, this, this idea of, of the description of miracles. Uh, he, 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 Hume just doesn't buy that. He doesn't buy that these miracles happen. Waitley and Campbell both do buy that miracles happen. Uh, and so how do you know what is true? At the, at the basics, that's what the epistemologists were asking. How do you know what is true? So you have Descartes, and Descartes says, how can we know what's true? Well, we're going to doubt anything. We're not going to believe anything we possibly could doubt. So are you in this room right now? Are you sure? Pretty sure. Yeah, you're pretty sure. <laughs> you're not completely sure that you're in this room right now. This could be the stupidest dream you've ever had in your life. And just take off your clothes and see how it goes, and then you'll know it's real. Because uh, in a dream, it'll be okay. Uh, but anyway, the, 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 no, it's, uh, we've had dreams. I've had dreams that have taken place in this room. So I probably spend more time in this room than you do. But I've had dreams that have taken place in this room. I've had dreams where I have gotten the, uh, uh, one of the, I've looked up a word from the Oxford English Dictionary in this room. And I thought that was real when it happened. Although I was having trouble reading. That's where the dream got dreamy. I can't read. I forgot how to read. Uh, it was a really horrible thing. Really, really horrible. Uh, but yeah, I've had dreams. That, but you say, no, no, this could be a dream. This could be, um, you know? What did you have for breakfast this morning? A bagel. A bagel? Protein shake. Protein shake. How, how do you know that there wasn't some hallucinogens in there? And the rest and of the room so I think you might have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing might not be real. This whole thing might not be real. Or how about this? Have any of you ever been sure you had a conversation with somebody? Yeah. And then the more you find out you Didn't. must not have, but you remember it? So how do you know that you're here right now? You can't. Can't know that you're here right now. So Dakar would say we should doubt that. We should doubt that. And so you everything that you can't know for sure. But here's the thing: even if you're not here right now, can you know that you are? And Dakar would say, well, if I am knowing, then I am. I think that. I think, therefore, I am. That's, that's where that comes from. If you know, because you, whether you are dreaming right now or whether you're dead right now, and this is heaven, unfortunately, um, although I, for me this is kind of what heaven would be, and I'm sorry if it's not for you, because for me we'd totally be talking about uh, communication philosophy with heaven for the rest of eternity. Uh, so I would love that. I would love that. Maybe more comfortable chairs and, uh, and a whiskey sour. Uh, that, 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 to me, I think would hit, hit heaven pretty well. Um, but yeah, even if you're dead, even if you're in heaven, or maybe this is hell, uh, whatever, it, you are because you are. Now, am I? You don't know. You can doubt that. But are you? You can be pretty sure. I can be pretty sure that I exist. You can be pretty sure that you exist. And then from that, he reasons to the existence of God. Because if you exist, then you're having thoughts. Thoughts need a source. Where does the source come from? And ultimately ends up, not only, you exist and God exists, and that's what we can know. Uh, so you got to, uh, you got, Biko thinks that's all kind of silly. Um, I don't know if he knew about Dakar. I don't know. If he, I don't remember him citing Dakar outright. Vika thinks that's all kind of silly, um, and it is. It is. I, I, Dakar's right, I, I think, uh, but it's also silly. What we can know, we exist. I think, therefore, I am. So what? Now I've got to live in this world that may or might not be real, uh, and and uh, Vika says it doesn't matter if it's real or not. You still got to live in it. <laughs> 
And so instead, what you should do is you should get as what he calls verisimilitude. Verisimilitude. Uh, verisimilitude. Verily, whoever reads Old King James Bible, verily, verily, I say unto you. And then in the new versions, it says, truly, truly, I say unto you. Verily means truly. So you should get closer to truth, as tr close to truth as you can. Uh, so he's really interested in trying to get as close to truth as you can. Um, the other epistemologists, uh, I think I would even have John Locke in there. Uh, John Locke, you should know, you should know John Locke. Uh, John Locke's writings are the basis of our Constitution, so they're kind of important for Americans. Uh, they're the basis of our Constitution. They're the basis, uh, for sure, of our Declaration of Independence. In fact, life, liberty, and property is John Locke. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is Thomas Jefferson. It's plagiarism, uh, except for that concept hadn't been developed yet. But it, it is. It is Jefferson plagiarized Locke a lot. Um, but but he's, he's looking at it, and he's looking at the ways in which he's worried that we can mess up our experience of truth with language. And Francis Bacon is also worried about uh, one of the theories you can choose from is, is, the, is Bacon's theory of the four idols. He was an epistemologist. Uh, the four idols are these things that he says happen when humans use language that actually take us away from the experience of truth. And that's what these epistemologists are really interested in, is the experience of truth. And how do we know what is true? And if that's an important question for you, then these are important people to, uh, to be examining. Uh, if you want to know what is true, and right now, I think would be a good time in history to, to go back and look at our epistemologists a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of concern about what is fake news. Uh, what is, how do we know whether the media is telling our tr the truth? How do we know whether particular members of the government are telling us the truth? How do we know what is real? And that's the questions that, that the, the, the epistemologists really get down to. So I, like I said, I think that would be a good place to start. If nothing shows up on the discussion board soon, we'll send an email to the person who's supposed to be leading the discussion and say, you haven't been leading the discussion. Uh, so maybe he will. Uh, let's see. From next week, right? I don't remember. But uh, I sent an email to that person. But if not, this is where we'll start the discussion. We'll start the discussion. I'll put up the video as soon as it can. It's going to go to YouTube, and then they've got to turn it into a different form and all this stuff. Yes, sir. I have a question. As a co-leader, what exactly are you doing? You and the leader. You, you, and the, you are co-leaders. So you come up with the question together, and then you facilitate the discussion together. You're with me, I think. Uh, no, I'm not. But I can be. Doesn't matter. What's your name? Raul. Yeah, you're with me. Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Aaron. Uh, anyway, so uh, anyway, the, the yeah, that's what a co leader does. That, you, that'll, uh, that'll be our question. When do you want to get together? Um, How can the epistemologists help us understand? Are you up here later today? I'm here all day. I'm not working right now, so. Okay. Um, maybe around two. Where at? Do you want to get my number now? Text each other.